they they're in 2020 they received their ORAD their their uh, wetlands delineation and th in three years later um, it expired and um, you know I would suggest that that's a bit of sloppiness on the part of the developer and um, I would be concerned about what that bodes for the future but anyway where we but they have gotten another They've done another ANRAD, another wetlands delineation. And where we are now is there with this new wetlands delineation, there are really a lot of concerns. You know, um, their predictions are that the Northeast is just going to get wetter and wetter. And we have we see this in this ANRAD that has come up three years later. We see a new um a new intermittent stream at the access road. We see new vernal pools. We see um, the the wetlands have expanded, and um, so now, what and what we're dealing with is what what the town is is doing. It, the um, the project is going through through the conservation commission as well as the zoning board. But it would seem to me it, they they do these things concurrently, and I guess that is. Oh, that's the way it's done. But it would seem to me that one of the concerns is that until the Conservation Commission authorizes this to go forward, it would seem to me that the Zoning Board is not in a position to give a special permit. And the Conservation Commission, what will the next step here is that the Conservation, what will come before the Conservation Commission will be a notice of intent from the developer. And this notice of intent will present a plan of what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. And um, the Conservation Commission has jurisdiction over the wetlands and over the vernal pools and the intermittent streams, et cetera. So that's what that's where we are. That's what we're faced with now. And part of the reason I contacted Pat and Lynn is because this is this project that's being done in district two. So, you know, as the counselors of district two, I thought it was important that, you know, we, we express our concerns and, you know, many of us are, are very opposed to this project. We feel that the other thing is that in North Amherst, that's where most there's, I think, about 95% of the wells of of private wells where we're not, we don't have town sewer, we don't have town water, and we have like 95, not, I could be complete, a little wrong, 90, 95% of the private water source, and at the same time, um, so, and so, um, so the concern is that with clear cutting, with strip mining, all of this forest land, it could very easily affect the water. It could very easily affect our wells. Um, the erosion that could occur from this, that the land is sloped um, and a lot of concerns about that. We have the Adams Brook, which flows into the Fort River, um, which flows into the, the town water supply. So um, these are just, this is just a few of the concerns, and um, I may have left out some things. So if anybody else wants to jump in and um, help update where we are now, that I would appreciate it, or have questions or whatever. And I, I know that, you know, as counselors, you, Pat and Lynn and Andy's here too, and Pam, you know, um, I, I don't know that the council necessarily weighs in on this. You you you're weighing in on the solar bylaw, and we know that this project would be grandfathered in, would have nothing to do with the solar bylaw. But we do right. also believe that if the solar bylaw moves ahead, maybe the zoning board will look at what the the solar bylaw will propose as best practices and take that into consideration when they, you know, um, look to grant a special permit. And I would also hope that our District 2 counselors, at least, would be able to speak as individuals, not necessarily as counselors, 
because it hasn't come before you yet, to support this, given that this is District 2 and that this is something that will impact District 2 very strongly. Right. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to now look for hands, either if you're in the audience or you're on screen. And the first one is Jacob Hirsch, and I'm going to ask him to go ahead. Hi, I'm wondering, um, Lynn, if you or Andy could explain to us what's the standard for allowing um, a commercial development or an industrial power plant in an area that's zoned residential? I kind of feel like when we bought our property, we looked around and saw things all around us zone residential, and that that was kind of a contract that I had with the town that provided me safety for this major asset that I've invested in. And now I find that, um, you know, down the street, somebody can just change that or apply to change that zoning. I feel like we're all very vulnerable if that's the case. Mm -hmm. What's the standard? you do have to apply for any changes in zoning and uh depending on the level that does have to be voted on i'm going to look to andy who's had more experience with zoning changes over the years andy do you have anything you want to comment on that one pam you may also have some comments on that yeah i was going to say pam because she's on crc and has been delving into the issues more experience than I do because even on the select board, we didn't really have uh, a role in uh, zoning because uh, it was a uh, matter of zoning decisions were made out of town meeting through the planning board. Uh, but uh, I think that the point that you raised uh, gets into the question of not the land, we always have to remember it's not the land we live on, it's the land that is being proposed for development. And uh, I don't know what zoning is on that land that some of you who have been working on the issue may be aware it's of. It's residentially zoned. That's the whole point. It is, it is residentially zoned. So, oh, Pam, do you have any insight into this? Uh, I was actually going to ask for questions if people had specific questions. This is a really good question. Um, mm -hmm. Before I before I weighed in about the, the status of the zoning bylaw, um, I think one of the one of the trade offs or one of the the points of contention in much of what's going on with solar bylaw development, or excuse me, solar development itself <clears throat> is that the state is encouraging us strongly to uh, yeah. not in, not intercede with um, solar array development to the point that it can't be built. So they're certainly encouraging us to go the route of, of accommodating uh, with, yeah. with uh, safeguards and and the fact that um, I actually don't have an answer to the fact that you live in a in an RO or RN district. I don't have that map up in front of me, um, but that is the outlying or, or or residential neighborhood zoning that establishes setbacks for distance from your property line, or setbacks from the street, or how much frontage you need. And frankly, solar, something as industrial as a solar array has, has actually not occurred yet in most of our districts. Um, the solar bylaw that we're working on at the moment is trying to understand the impacts in a range of districts, but primarily in District 2 because you folks have large parcels of undeveloped forested land. Uh, the solar bylaw will not protect you at this point because we, we don't have it in place. And the proposal and the project was was, um, was sent in prior to the establishment of the solar bylaw. But it is exactly what prompted uh, the council and many residents to push for a, a goal for the, for the town manager 
um, to get this done. So, so that did not really, that did not really answer your question. Right, Jacob. Um, I'm going to come back to you, but I'm going to go to Michelle. Please unmute. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, hi. Um, hi. Um, I actually had a comment about the bylaw. So I'm just going to jump back to something Renee said um, regarding the wells and how I think it states in the bylaw about 4% of Amherst is on wells and they're fairly concentrated in District 2. And in the solar bylaw, when they talk about setbacks for development, they did change the setbacks for the public wells. Um, and that's on account of um, gallon drawing per day. So those are big wells, but you know, it's remaining a hundred foot from every residential well in district two. And I, they, they talk about potential impacts, the wells, and yet they decide in the bylaw to remain at, remain at a hundred. And I'm not a hydrologist, but all the wells on our street are about a hundred feet apart. <laughs> And there's got to be some more accumulative accounting for that. So I just want to call attention to the fact that um, it seemed that private wells were kind of discounted in the bylaw. Especially when they're that many close together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Michelle, was there anything? Go ahead, Pam. I'd love to respond. So that is, that is in fact, an important feature, an important piece of information. Uh, the committee that's working in the bylaw is has just simply received it. And now we're in the process of saying, does the section on setbacks make sense? Do we need additional setbacks to protect private wells? So that's the kind of feedback that we really need going forward. Eric, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks so much, Lynn. Um, I was gonna comment on, on the nature of Shootsbury Road, which, uh, um, probably many of us know we uh, we live live on this street, but some people who do not live on the street probably know that it's a very it's a rural street. The um the access road to this gigantic project is at a, is on a blind curve with school buses, emergency vehicles, pedestrians. There are no sidewalks. People bike up and down. It's a very da dangerous spot. Um, for an um, unimaginably large um, project that really is ill-suited for the uh, landscape, let alone for the, the neighborhood, the particular street it's on. I'd like to actually go, also go back to his, for a second because um, uh, those of us who are on private wells have attended countless meetings since 2019, and uh, one of the uh, sets of meetings that we we uh, we attend twice a year because it meets twice a year is the Water Supply Protection Committee. And when we um, uh, raised at least three four years ago our concern about the implications for a project of this scale and its impact on um, the, water, the water, our private wells, uh, we were told, right. first of all, that the Water Supply Protection Committee has jurisdiction only on public water, and that the Board of Health has the sole jurisdiction for governing and regulating and protecting private wells. Unfortunately, the Board of Health has, uh, when it was given a seat at the table in crafting the solar, solar bylaw, um, it declined mm. to, um, to have a, a member of the Board oh. of Health sit on that committee and, um, and, cra and craft um, a, a solar by a, a bylaw. And the, which was very, very dismaying to us, given that those of us on private wells on Shootsbury Road really have no representation from the town itself. So that's to say dismaying and concerning um, is, uh, is uh, an understatement. Yeah. The, uh, the, currently the, 
the project is um, is as uh, Renee mentioned in front of uh, the Conservation Commission waiting for the NOI, but it's also in front of the ZBA. And the ZBA is the sole permitting body mm -hmm. right. for this project. It is whatever happens, yay or nay, will happen through you putting the, the ZBA. Cantaloupe away? And, Which I took out. And, oh, Excuse me, please. I took it out. Put it on the table. Mute you. Hold on. Okay. And um, true, true to form, uh, as I said, we've been at countless, countless meetings um, uh, that wherever this project touches down, and um, uh, the ZBA uh, uh, was looking at a project. Um, represented by uh, uh, the applicant, Pure Sky, which uh, really had, the, there were so many um, sl sloppy indications of the, of the kind of work that Pure Sky does. And in fact, Renee mentioned that it was, it lost its uh, ANRAD delineation because it expired. It just expired under under its it, under pure, under pure sky's nose. They they allowed it to lapse, and what was um, kind of incredulous to me was how the ZBA could continue to look at the project despite not having a a a, 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 a an accepted um, a wetlands delineation. I mean, mm -hmm. it was uh, the logic um, kind of defied defied me because if you don't know what the wetland situation is, how can you propose a project on top of this unknown landscape? Um, so I I think that the um, pure sky has really proven to be a really um, uh, kind of um, so sloppy cavalier applicant and um uh the uh so so i there the many many other uh, instances i won't go into because i think i would like to share the uh um uh, the podium with someone other than we have um other people from uh smart solar amherst with us other neighbors who probably could add some great great and revealing information but it's it really is for us we are we are I make no mistake we are devoted to solar energy but we feel this is the wrong place for this project so i'm i'm going to stop for a moment and just say in addition to Shootsbury road flat hills um high point and I'm blanking on the other name, Jeremy, you might remember, the other road up with High Point. They're right. all on wells as well. Right. They are, every one of them are on wells. And um, there's a couple other areas back in that area of um, Amherst that that is where the four to five percent of wells are in Amherst. Gordon, you had your hand up. I want to come back. You're shaking your head no. Okay, Jeremy? Anderson? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Overlook was the other neighborhood. Overlook, and then there's, there's Juniper. And, uh, um, but just uh, really quickly, just wanted to follow up with, with the wells, especially. Um, and, and I attended one of the early um, ECAC meetings um, where, where there were discussions about well setback. And so for Pam um, um, and just kind of following up comments, I was just, you know, I, I, I'm not used to uh, or trying to learn a little bit about town politics, but I was just really disappointed by the dismissiveness of the ECAC committee when we brought up well setback. It was just as a homeowner, as someone who has kids that were on this well, and just to have people, one of the members was talking about how you know, I should be more worried about the oil tank in my basement leaking than I should be about pollution from this, this, you know, this real source that, that could be leaching into the water. And I just, you know, just just to share that experience that's you know mm -hmm. i feel like private well owner you know 
if, if the town wanted to spend lots of money and put well water in, you know, like that's one thing, but, but that's not on the table. Um, and so like, we should have the same protections as everybody else in this town. Uh, and that's just, it would be so easy to have that be like, we, you know, we want to give everyone, we want to treat everyone in this town equally and give everyone the same protection. And, and that, you know, that just that, that, that kind of gesture, that kind of outreach shows the community that, that we care. Um, so I just wanted to share that experience. I'm sorry. Kathleen? You're muted on mute. Sorry about that. I just want to say here, here to all of the comments that have been made and especially to Jeremy, who's getting to the main point I'd like to, to raise, which is the town has a responsibility for the health, safety and welfare of all of its citizens mm -hmm. and to cavalierly disregard what possibilities uh, could happen on this uh, 100 acres site uh, is, is ignoring that responsibility on the part of the town or on the part of the people who are trying to push it forward for whatever reasons. There's clearly has been a, a, a uh, survey that was taken last year in which the vast majority of people, even given the questions, the framing of the questions, were clearly against taking down forest for solar. And uh, and that, that whole survey just seems to be disregarded. In the case that Jeremy's talking about, there was somebody on one of the committees who who knew something about hydrology, who was really poo-pooing the uh, uh, possibility that there could be a problem. Our next door neighbor has had a basement flooded this past year uh, that the water just kept coming and coming and coming off of that area in subterranean water, that there is, there is groundwater and there's surface water and uh, these things are all kind of co congregating around the access road, the beginning of the access road. So what people don't know is where is where is the uh, how does water flow in this whole area up here? Flat Hills, uh, Overlook, Juniper, and of course Shutesbury Road. How how does that water flow? What are the what are the underground um, surfaces on which that water glides as it goes uh, towards people's wells and goes through various uh, cuts through the uh, through the um, through the material? So one other aspect, certainly wells, huge problem. This could absolutely devastate all of these houses around here were the water to become polluted, you know, mm -hmm. inadvertently, or just by saying, well, we just think there's maybe a 1% chance of this happening. Well, 1% chance of our of us not having water is a pretty serious uh, uh, risk for anybody to be taking um, for our health, safety, and welfare. The other issue I, I'd like to raise here, it, we haven't brought up tonight, is the issue of fire. Mm -hmm. There are batteries involved here. These are the batteries that were intended originally for that uh, site on, on Shutesbury Road were batteries that last year had fires. Mm -hmm. And those fires in New York State uh, they were people were saying, well, you know, with these batteries, you, you you're not going to put it out. The the fire would be contained in the boxes, and that that is the um, the preferred method of putting out the fires uh, with these lithium batteries. Well, as it turned out, we have photographs of how one battery caused the next battery to go on fire, and they were you could see from from uh, drone photographs that the fire just went from battery to battery. Mm -hmm. And when questioned about how this, how these batteries had failed, there was a lot of hemming and hawing and talking about proprietary rights. Um, uh, there were suggestions that uh, people could speak individually as 
on a telephone call individually with or come in to speak to somebody about what had actually happened. In other words, nobody wanted to be on the record uh, for what actually had happened to those uh, to those batteries and the danger that they would present, especially in an area like this, which is very isolated. It, it would take a while before anybody would know that a fire had started. The question is, you know, does it stay put? Does it create uh, does it create pollution in the in the air or in the ground? Uh, the newer batteries they're suggesting have some kind of liquid uh, uh, method of putting out the fires. Where is that liquid going to go to? Is that going to go into our wells? So that the danger of it, even the fire department knowing that something's going on there and then eventually getting through this very long road uh, that comes to a, an, an end and has no access from another from another point. It's it's uh, it's something I don't even like to think about. So and my third thing, which uh, concerns me greatly is not about safety, health, and welfare, but it's really the safety, health, and welfare of all the wildlife that live in those woods. And there seems to be no governmental entity that is protecting them. Mm -hmm. So every morning we wake up to truly, I don't know, 30, 30 or more birds, different species of birds, that are singing in those woods that we can we we have been able to capture on um, on recordings, mm -hmm. and they're there all the time. And then in the winter, it's a different group, and some of them remain, some of them come. It is a very important wildlife area, not meant to be a sanctuary. It's it's their environment. And so we see the frogs and we, we see uh, uh, there have been turtles coming out of that, that area as well. And I, I just think that there's, there's a very complicated set of wildlife and human life issues that are raised by this. For every person who's walking down the street, there are no sidewalks here. Uh, coming around that corner, you could, I could easily see a serious accident happening. So many other things to say, but I'll leave it at that. So I want to just uh, go back to Pam. Uh, you, uh, the council a year, a year and a half ago now, uh, actually asked that there be a solar bylaw working group formed. It was formed. They uh, developed a draft of a bylaw, but not a complete bylaw. And that was then referred to Community Resources Center, CRC, and which Pam is chair of. And so Pam, can you kind of give us a sense of what the work plan is for that? Sure. Uh, I think I'm on speaker. Yes, I am on speaker. Um, the, work, <clears throat> the work plan going forward is that uh, starting probably in July, we will have the opportunity to take all the components that the, the working group put together for us, and they did a very good job. There are something like 15 sections of this bylaw. We started to, we started to pull it apart to see if maybe some, were, some sections were better suited as um, rules and regulations that the, that the zoning board might follow or that might simply be addressed in a memo to uh, transmit a new bylaw to the council for voting. But in general, there are a lot of really good sections of this bylaw that reflect uh, templates that were developed in one case by Cape Cod Commission, which does a really good job of planning on the Cape. And so looking at do we do we have all of the do we have all the topics covered? Do we have um, do we have them covered to a degree that um, somebody could actually make a decision looking at them by using this? Um, one of the things that did not happen is that staff 
uh, departments, for instance, um, I think there was some staff input on the formation of this draft bylaw, but there was not a concentrated focus and a request from, let's say, the community resources com committee to CONCOM or to the Board of Health. I would like very much to reach out to the Board of Health and say, we need your input on this because you it is under your purview um, apparently now that I understand that the, the private wells are under the purview of the Board of Health. So we would go through during probably the latter half of July and August and into September when hopefully staff are around to go to boards and committees, to go to staff and to get the the editing of this document from basically a, uh, a rough structure to the details. Um, there are also a lot of really good resources that I could point people to that the working group put together. And those are, those are often um, added to the packet for each of the meetings for the community resource committee. And it will say resources. And I, I have lumped it all into sort of resources for solar bylaws. If anybody would like that list in its entirety, just email me and my my email is similar to Lynn's or Andy's. It is my last name, first initial at amherstmod.gov. And I will forward you that entire list of resources. Um, and, there, and there are some great ones too. Um, I wish that, I wish this were moving faster and I wish that we, um, we had a lot of the feedback, but I think what I'm what I'm looking forward to is actually starting with some of the editing and some scrutiny of, in fact, the setbacks. There's some discrepancy. It can't be, uh, you know, solar. The edge of a solar array can't be um, closer than 400 feet to a public um, water source. But then in the next sentence, it says something like 100 feet from um, 50 feet from a property line, but it doesn't necessarily specify how many feet it can be from an, from an adjoining uh, well. And so those are the kinds of details that we simply just haven't even looked at in detail, um, but want very much to. Thank you. I'm Michelle, looking, come, go ahead, Pam. No, I was going to, I'm looking at Michelle. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm I'm actually just going to interject with a question about the agenda, Lynn. Are we are we in open discussion right now? I guess I want to finish this off and then move to open discussion. Okay. 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 Thanks. Sure. Renee, you're you have done mute. Yeah. Um. It it's a real pleasure to have you here, Pam. Um. And appreciate um your. Uh, informing us about what the CRC is doing. One of the things um, some of us who are on the screen have gone had gone to every single solar bylaw working group meeting and then saw the final product. And one of my major concerns, and we've also looked at so many other solar bylaws from so many other towns throughout throughout Massachusetts. And one thing that deeply concerns me is that um, there is no maximum size limit for um, that this committee, that the solar bylaw working group was not willing to put a maximum size limit on the solar array. And I, I think that it was very much guided by the planning department in all, you know, honesty, I have to say that. And I think it was really bad advice. And I think that it, it, it it's it's a terrible thing that if Amherst goes forward with a bylaw that has no maximum size limit. So that that's all. But I thank you so much, and I'd love to see that list of resources. So um, why don't you send me your email? I will. And Pam, I'm going to suggest you send it to me, and I'll send it out to my mailing list as well. Thank you, uh, Jacob. You have your hand up. Please unmute. Yeah, there's another issue um, 
that I'm very concerned about living in the neighborhood, and that is the effect on the air quality. No one has talked about that. But who likes to walk next to a highway with trucks driving by? We have families and many people taking walks as um, I think Eric said, there's no sidewalks in this neighborhood. So people are walking on the edge of the street and imagine how many trucks are gonna be required to haul away the 6,000 trees of unknown length and all the slag that's associated with the trees. Um, it will take years of trucks, probably a hundred a day. Who knows how many they can uh, get in and out of a single access road a day and how long it takes to fill up the truck. But the neighborhoods around here will be um, breathing diesel fumes for the entire length of that time. There's also going to be a lot of pollution that goes on with the cutting and the construction in the, in the woods there. And um, Maybe Renee, uh, sorry, maybe Michelle can answer, but who's going to monitor the water quality of um, that area? I looked up what diesel fumes consist of, and generally there are the type of molecules that cause acid rain and cancer. So those are two big things that are, this neighborhood is going to be subjected to. Are there any, uh, I mean, this is obviously an ongoing discussion, and I truly want to say I thank uh, the residents of District 2 that have taken this on as a major, major project. Um, several of you are on the screen and in the meeting with us today, uh, and the fact that you've been monitoring this is, uh, as a neighbor in the area who is, has a well, I have to just say, I appreciate that someone is taking the time to really, really uh, pay attention to this on literally a daily basis. Uh, Andy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I uh, would concur with what you just said and followed up with the question. Um, I really appreciate hearing from all of you. Uh, I try and attend district meetings when I can, and I find that uh, sometimes they're um, really important learning experiences because uh, so many of you have different, are exposed to different issues and have different pieces of information that normally get to us. And so um, I frequently learn a lot from meetings like this. And so I want to thank you. The one question that I have gets back to something Renee said uh, fairly early, which was the direction of the water flow and the Water Protection uh, Committee. Does any of the water from this area flow in the direction of the Atkins Reservoir? Um, Andy, I, yeah, go ahead, Eric. You may have some answers to that. I, I don't think it does, Andy, no. but it does directly into the Adams Brook, which is a secondary tributary to the Connecticut River, a primary tributary to the Fort River watershed, and which provides a vast amount of, of water in the Lawrence Swamp area. So it's not just simply the private wells that perhaps are vulnerable but the public water supply is in jeopardy as yeah. well, because topographically speaking, if there's a it's a south southeastern, uh, so let me get my directions. Southerly, I'll say southerly, a tilt of the land that goes through, and at the bottom of this project is the Adams Brook. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, I don't think it does go into the reservoir, but the other piece that, and those of you that have been working on this are extremely aware of, and that is we're just part of a much larger project that goes well beyond the borders of Amherst. And so the fact that uh, the, those of you that have been daily active with this have been working with our neighboring towns has also been critically important. Kathleen? I was just going to say what you said, that uh, 
in, in what Andy was asking about, about Atkins, uh, there are people in Shutesbury who have uh, already made it clear that one of the projected sites for, um, for it was an AMP pro program, was actually in the Atkins, uh, uh, in the direction of the Atkins Reservoir. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the people in Pelham are quite concerned about all of this having gone on without being uh, informed that it was something that could uh, impact their land just on the other side of the of the lot line, because yeah. this goes right up against the the division between Amherst and Pelham. This land is on the Amherst Pelham line. Thank you. And, and I also want to say thank you to Lynn and Andy for uh, being appreciative of listening to people. And indeed, this has been a huge, huge issue, kind of devouring a big part of our lives for the past almost four years now. And going to meetings, people are given just tiny little two or three minute sections of, of trying to choose, pick and choose between what's the most important thing to mention. And mm -hmm. uh, I really appreciate this forum for people it's, to be able to speak up. As Thank the you. person as the person who has to time all the three or two minute uh, comments at council meetings, it's a blessing to be at a district meeting where I don't have to follow those rules. <laughs> um, Karen, you have your hand up. Hi. Um, well, I am. I my house is directly across from the access road, and I am embarrassed to say I have not been. Um, as involved as my neighbors, I want to thank all of my neighbors who have been really following this issue and and uh, holding people to account. I have been going uh, recently to meetings, and I just want to uh, again uh, echo the the sentiment that this is uh, this broad based discussion has been so informative and so much more um, uh, constructive in many ways than the than the and it's not just the two or three minute um, uh, limitations. It's the it's the uh, constricted nature of the discussion. Uh, this is the first time I've heard a discussion that really thinks about the town overall. And if but if we think about if if this neighborhood, if the wells are damaged, if the septic is damaged, if suddenly the town needs to bear the expense of mitigating all of that damage uh all of that is is going to have profound economic uh impact on the town uh to say nothing of the overall water uh you know for the lawrence lawrence swamp wells and all of that so i really appreciate this broad-based discussion that's really thinking about the overall health and welfare of the town and its residents thank you Eric, uh, let's see if we can have a final comment and then go on to other issues that are burning for people. Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate your wanting to calm me down, throw <laughs> cold water on me. But um, I think that, you know, we are just, uh, there's an invisible boundary between Amherst and Shutesbury. And the, um, and uh the five projects that are proposed by Pure Sky in Shutesbury, as, um, several of them are located through which the Adams and the Dean Brooks, two main tributaries to the Atkins Reservoir, flow directly through those projects. 55% of the water in the town of Amherst comes out of the Atkins Reservoir. Mm -hmm. what what kind of jeopardy the public water system is in a, a looking at vis-a-vis -vis the destruction of the Adams, uh, the um, the dean and the dean and Nurse Brook through by creating these projects in Shutesbury is very questionable. So yeah. I do and thank you. Yes, I think giving us an opportunity to talk to our neighbors and to our counselors is so important. So thank you so much, Lynn, for this opportunity. I'm glad we're doing that. Jenny, some brief comments. Jenny, you need to unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, great. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Uh, just to 
unfortunately end on a terribly uh, dark note. It's not only the wells and the septic, when the land is destabilized, then we can have sl uh, slides into our land. Our land can be covered with mud. Uh, we can look at videos of other places where this has happened. So it's actually not just wells and septic, but also these slides. And I wanna point out, especially following what Karen said, uh, solar projects always have surety bonds for decommissioning. And if this project goes forward, I think the town will need to think about whether we need a surety bond for the wells of everybody in the area as well as our land. And I have spoken to insurance people, individual insurance is virtually impossible to get for this kind of uh, destruction. It has to do with uh, the water being groundwater, how many uh, properties are affected. But if, if this project were to go forward, I think we would need to start insisting that the town put up the landowner put up, Pure Sky put up, somebody put up a surety bond in advance because predicting whether or not they're able to stabilize the land, protect the wells and uh, protect septic systems is not possible. We know that we're this site, as we've seen from talking to experts, is exactly the kind of site where these disasters take place because of the hills, the hilliness of it, the, uh, the way in which the trees are gonna be taken out, we are at risk, there's no doubt about it. And so the project will have to be looked at from the point of view, uh, as Karen was saying, you know what the financial costs would be, but I think it has to be looked at as what, what the financial costs would be to all of us in advance, and somebody's gonna have to insure our properties uh, in in the event that that we do have this kind of disaster. So how to build that in through the ZBA or with the help of the town council uh, is something we're gonna have to work on. For the solar bylaw, that's a whole other issue. As we know, it doesn't affect us, but this is something that we will definitely need help. And it's great to have the counselors here uh, when we're working with the ZBA, if if we get to that point. Thank you. Uh, and I, I really do want to, uh, literally, Pam Rooney agreed to jump on this meeting tonight about a half an hour before the meeting. And it was, I really just want to thank her uh, for doing that. Uh, it's just a great opportunity to have the chair of CRC with us uh, and hearing uh, people's concerns. I know I've made a deep list starting off with, you know, whether or not you can do this in a residential area, Jacob, I, I noted that. So, uh, Pam, did you have some things you wanted to say? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, that I actually need to go, but okay. that I but that I heard a couple of really good points that need to be reiterated. Um, we're talking about Board of Health involvement, public uh, private wells versus public wells, both of which are important, um, but we're talking here about the private wells. Um, uh, we have the maximum size limit that, that nobody wrote into the draft or the proposed bylaw. Um, we also have, we have a, uh, an important question about the downstream flow from the site um, to any of our water sources, including Atkins, including uh, Lawrence Swamp. Um, and then the surety bonds for protection of, of property. So right. those are things that, um, that I would, if people have specifics that they, that they think are important to get written into the, into the bylaw and the parameters, I think that's really helpful. And I would, again, I'll send, Lynn has my email address. She can send that out to people um, and just say, if you have questions or or points of concern that you think the, the CRC should address, 
please send that because this is the time to do it. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a couple public forums, but I would much rather get people's input ahead of time so that we can flesh those out um, before the forums and have them available for discussion. Thank Jake, you. Thank you, Pam, so much. And I've taken some notes and we'll compare notes as well. Uh, Jacob, you have your hand up. Yes, thanks. I had uh, two more things I just wanted to say quickly. And one was directly addressing one of Pam, uh, Pam's comments. <clears throat> and that is that the state um, uh, requires towns to um, accept solar sites without, um, right. you know, they it's like blackmail. They're sort of pushing it on us. And I think one way to get around that threat is for town bodies to proactively choose certain sites in town where solar would be welcome. I'd love to see solar over all the Amherst College parking lots. I'd love to see solar on all the UMass parking lots. For mm -hmm. some reason, they did a few and then they stopped. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there are lots of sites where we would encourage solar and we'd all be in favor of it. Mm -hmm. I think forests, and now the state is beginning to recognize that clear-cutting forests isn't a good idea. So forests would be one that we would not welcome solar on. The other point I wanted to make is, is that <clears throat> who in the town is monitoring the Hickory Ridge solar array? It seems to me we, haven't, we have an opportunity to see how good a job they're doing. It's the same company. And um, I haven't heard any kind of reports from that. Nobody, nobody, um, on the town council has even asked questions about that I've heard anyway about you know how's it going at Hickory Ridge you know it seems like their progress has been in fits and starts and even there was a long period of time where I wondered maybe they've given up on the site they but at actually, any rate yeah they actually yeah. um did have some delay in getting their permit and we actually as a council did have an update about Hickory Ridge probably sometime in the last uh, 60 days. I, I know it was on one of our council and the issue of the solar did come up. So it is something that people are paying attention to. And I also know that people on the Zoom have been paying attention to Hickory Ridge as well. So um, it is a concern. It is the same company and it is important to watch it. Kathleen will take one more comment and then I want to okay. make sure that other people, Pamela, yeah. I just wanted to say before Pam leaves, the uh, other issue on your list could be noise. And noise. it's construction, pollution, noise, noise pollution, I and, uh, and ongoing uh, noise pollution. Once these uh, pivoting solar panels are in operation, so it could be an issue of, of continuous noise. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Uh, Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Pam. You. So Michelle, I'm gonna to go to you because you asked, were we going to pivot to other questions? And so let's start with what yours is. Thanks. I didn't mean to be rude there. I just, I know I'm there's a lot of parents rude. with kids going crazy right now in the background. Um, so I, I would like to uh, visit the topic of a recent TSO meeting during which they discussed the town-wide 25 miles per hour. Um, and Andy was on that and it was a unanimous vote to move towards that. Um, so first of all, I really support this. This is something that a lot of people and a lot of families have been thinking about, talking about for a long time. Um, again, it only applies to the unmarked roads, which currently have a, a speed limit of 30 if they're not marked. Um, so I just wanted to revisit a decision that was made during that meeting, which I think is really important to revisit, which is that um, Director Moring gave sort of two options for a path forward for this, and all of the roads would be basically rolled up into a single plan or a single um, action. But one was just the only marking for 25 miles per hour would be at the entrances of the town. So that's similar to how we are marking the four feet buffer for cyclists right now. And then the other option was to mark each individual road, which is currently not marked. And I want to express strong support for the latter. I think the TSO went with the former, um, which is to just mark the entrances of the town. 
And I want to follow up with that with a comment made by Captain Ting during the meeting um, regarding a traffic study they did in Amherst Woods, where they found that most of the speeding was taking by neighbors, so people within the neighborhood. So we always like to say that it's like Amazon or passers through, but it's not. It's just the neighbors and it people get into a rhythm and they're thinking about other things and they're just every day. <laughs> um, and I really think it's super important to have the signs marked and just the visibility. And it seemed to me like uh, Guilford Mooring was um, a proponent, hold on, uh, was a proponent of the marking each and Vildra Road. And he likened it to where he grew up actually. Mama. And hold on, Mama, hold on. Daddy's not in it. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Mama, um, Daddy can't hear you. Challenge. Sorry. Um. Anyway, I think having each individual mode marked is really important. And I'll just give High Point Drive as an example. So people are coming off Northeast Streets, 40, 35 on Flood Hills, and they just sort of continue that speed through a pretty dense residential neighborhood. And I, I think people just need to see that it's 25 miles per hour if and when you guys go through with that. So that's that's my comment. Thank you for listening. Very timely because this issue is coming up before the council on Monday, the 17th. Uh, Gordon Freed, please unmute and go ahead. I haven't been following town <clears throat> stuff as much, except, of course, I live in Echo Hill, and there's markings on Heatherstone Road for, for reconfiguring, and I'm wondering... I saw something in the newspaper about different roads that were going to be started within the next week. And Heatherstone wasn't on there, but I wasn't sure if that just means it's not this week, but next week or something sometime before the winter. Actually, uh, interestingly enough, the head of your of the North North Echo Hill, Hill, Hill Association. Association has been in touch with Guilford Mooring and has CC'd me on emails trying to make sure that she knows in plenty of time to alert neighbors as to when Heatherstone will start. It has been approved by the council. Uh, that was done at our last meeting, and uh, so it will be moving ahead. It'll happen hey, in the I summer. I don't know if I'm allowed to have one tiny little thing, and maybe it's more of an association thing. We have this divider between Alpine and Aub and Echo Hill Road, and I live on Echo Hill Road, and there's some plants in the middle of there. Are those going to be available for the taking when uh, they start to do it, or is that a very local thing? It's a really tiny point. I'm sorry. It's kind of a very local thing from what I've been able to gather. We've had uh, with Andy chairing TSO. You you have the chairs here tonight. Boy, I got to tell you, this is great. Uh, the TSO has held two listing sessions, one during the day, and then we did a special one in the evening. Uh, I kind of get the sense that the people who live right nearby have first dibs on those wonderful and beautiful hostas. <laughs> okay. Uh, Becca. Would... Yeah, go ahead, Andy. I can't say that we had that discussion uh, uh, to that level of detail for the project. My understanding is that uh, Heatherstone uh, is on the list for this year that we, because we were pressed to make a decision and get it to the council so that it would be in place for the construction season. And uh, the intent that was, uh, that we got from Guilford was that it would be done, it would be work done later in the summer. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Becca. Hi, thank you for hosting this meeting. Um, I have my seven-year-old here with me who actually wanted to speak. Mm -hmm. um, can you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Colin. And what did you want to talk about? I think we should make the speed limit a little slower so it would feel more safe okay. for kids. And yeah. Do you, go, do you go to Fort River? Yeah. So just the other day, Andy and myself and two other counselors 
hosted a group of students that bicycled or walked from Fort River, fifth graders, and we did a mock or pretend town council meeting. And they presented us with their proposal for bike lanes. And they particularly talked about the speeding cars. So thank you for that comment. Thank you. Uh, we're on Heatherstone Road, part of Echo Hill, that is pretty densely populated. Um, we would love nothing more than to see the town council approve the reduction townwide to 25 miles per hour, but specifically to take it a little further and reduce, you know, our street is marked 30. Um, so we would like to see the signs change on our street. And I, I can't say enough how much I'd love to see speed radar signs added to that. I understand uh, traffic calming measures are being added, um, but I think I think we need to start with the actual problem, with, which is the speed. I know people have talked about like, oh, it's your neighbors. And truthfully, I'm yelling at people who are driving the actual speed limit. So when I'm waving my arms at them and telling them to slow down, they usually just tell me off because they're going 30 miles per hour. Uh, because they can. So I would really love to see more push from um, our counselors to reduce the speed. I, my kids say very often that they don't feel safe when they're biking, walking. Um, so I would just love to see some support in that. Thank you. Thank you. Andy, did you want to comment? Yeah, uh, I guess I need to uh, clarify about this change in speed limit uh, because there was mention about posting and unposting. And uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at the whole set of state rules regarding speed limits um, prior to that TSO meeting. Unfortunately, for um, something that's already posted, um, what the rule is, is that there's special set of rules that have to do with uh, with posting, once a road is posted under those provisions, then that becomes the speed limit and the default speed limit is what we're talking about uh, when we say that there's a state statute that allows us to just blanketly reduce speed limits into 25 miles per hour on roads um, that are either um, dense or business district. Dense has to do with the number of houses within a certain part, distance of roads. It's very specifically spelled out in the um, state rules on the subject. Uh, and that's what that whole thing about uh, posting coming into town is sort of like giving notice of what um, if you do it that way, giving notice of what the default speed limit is. But um, I do have to advise that um, if it is already posted at a rate higher than 25, that remains the speed limit, um, even if we post other streets with 25. And we have to go through an entirely different process that is a lot more complicated it has to be done one road at a time and get approval from um, the state after we do the, um, a, a fairly thorough study. Uh, those who are involved with the Henry Street issue um, in the, the school, and I think I saw Jeremy um, earlier in the meeting, and he was one who was very involved in that. Uh, knows that it was not a simple process that we actually had to hire an engineer to get a um, opinion that uh, even with the Cushman School in the section that we're talking about, to get that change um, made, we had to go through a fairly complex process to satisfy Department, State Department of Transportation rules. So, uh, if the council adopts the statute that's recommended, it would affect streets that are um, currently unmarked, but marked streets um, already had 
an approved speed limit established and they would have to be changed one street at a time through that rather complex process. Thank you. Uh, Becca, I'm gonna come back to you in a moment, but Jason, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Thank you everybody for participating. I would also like to echo what Becca mentioned. We live in Echo Hill as well. And um, while uh, I'd also like to echo what Michelle said about Amherst Woods and this traffic study that was done there, or the enforcement that was done there, and they found it was mostly neighbors. I think that um, Echo Hill is a little bit different in that we have two major roads on either side of the neighborhood, and we have a gym and dense housing in the um, in the apartments and the townhomes there, and oftentimes, you know, we'll have people come from uh, Pelham Road over, and they're cutting over through the neighborhood to get to the gym, or vice versa, they're leaving the gym and they're cutting over to Pelham Road, or they're coming over to get to the townhomes or the apartments. So there's a pretty dense population in the neighborhood, even though it may not seem it right when you turn in onto uh, Heatherstone there from Pelham Road. Um, as you get down towards Belchertown Road there, Route 9, there's there's a, a lot more density in the neighborhood. So it and, sounds like uh, Heatherstone is one of those roads we want to start trying to see what we can do to change it yet again to from 30 to 25. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and my second comment is that I am all for the traffic calming measures. I I love them. I think it's a good start to put the circles in, mm -hmm. um, but sidewalks would be incredibly beneficial. You know, that's not to say that uh, if you put sidewalks in, then I'd be for everybody speeding through the neighborhood. We still want people to drive slowly through the neighborhood, but it takes a lot of the pressures off of um everybody if there's if we can remove people and dogs and out of the road and then the road is for bicyclists and for vehicles <laughs> and you know my last comment regarding the road in uh, heatherstone in particular is i understand that these traffic circles are going to be temporary and there's three of them right now and that the paving is only going up to albanwood uh, the roads in echo hill in general are a mess and it's my understanding they haven't been paved since the uh, neighborhood was built. Mm -hmm. uh, our home was built in 67. That is far, far beyond the life expectancy of a road. Mm -hmm. And it seems like something of failing, you know, I'm not, I don't want to point fingers, but just on, you know, in planning to not have a plan to pave roads, you know, in less than that amount of time. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're going to see this hodgepodge of temporary traffic calming measures, a newly paved road that's going to lead into a road that's full of potholes. And we seemingly don't have any idea when the next segment of the road is going to be paved. And maybe that has been determined. I'd like to know if that is the case. But the road from, from Heatherstone all the way down through Gatehouse Road back to Route 9 uh, is is in really bad shape. It is very definitely in bad shape. And uh, um, I haven't seen the schedule for next year. I did send the schedule out for this year uh, in the email I sent out last week. Um, and Andy, you updated us that Heatherstone's scheduled for later in the summer. But at, whether where they're going the to section, up in, but, yeah. but he's pointing out that the section is from Pelham Road into the intersection with Aubinwood. And that, uh, I mean, I th there's several things that I should, that I could say in addition. One is, is that uh, uh, generally I recognize also that there's a problem that once you do pave a road, it attempts people to drive faster, not slower, because the road condition is better. Uh, people definitely, uh, his uh, rough road is a uh, reason to drive slow, which is why people want speed humps, um, and uh, which is another entirely different question that we're talking about. The other thing is, is that uh, one of the advantages of doing the sidewalks the way that they're talking about is, is that uh, 
to make the road narrower and to build and to use that as the right of way for the sidewalk. And so in making the road narrower, I think actually does help slow down traffic too. And that was one of the th factors that was talked about during the uh, committee discussion. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a complicated process. And I think the other thing that um, Lynn and I have discussed is that we're $15 million behind on road. Uh, and so it's always a question of what road gets the priority. And part of the problem is, is that uh, DPW will recommend different road order at times if there's deterioration or um, if they discover problems that co cause them to feel that one road needs to be pushed higher on the list for some reason. Is there anybody that is getting any kind of grants or looking at any grant money from oh. the bipartisan infrastructure bill for things like green streets, safe streets, um just general infrastructure uh if we're 15 million dollars behind i'm going to say this and it's probably going to sound a little uh i don't want it to come off as smug or, or or i don't know but we pay a lot of money in property taxes yes. and to be told that there's a 15 million dollar deficit just to fix the roads does not reflect well it i hate to say this but it's not 15 it's 50 50 five zero Five zero. Yeah. Well, then that is even That's worse. even worse. And uh, we'll say you know, that Amherst as a town has been extremely vigilant about getting as much grant money as they can possibly get. And they're very successful. But it, it's this is a problem that the council has had discussions about. We want a multi-year plan and we want to know how we're going to solve this and ever catch up because it is awful. So for, I mean, I would love to see that. I, I just want to wrap up my comments on the on the street paving and just, you know, Andy went, gave us some details regarding um, the whole, it appears that the state is the one making the decisions as to what the town can post the speed limit on already posted roads. Yes. I'm not sure how that, um, it, that seems overbearing on the state's part. Um, but if that's the case, that's the case. Um, but I would like to advocate for beginning the process to overchange that on Heather Stone and on um, Stony Hill and throughout, I'm going to say the Echo Hill North and South neighborhoods. And I don't know, is, is, there a, is there a specific petition that has to start? How do we actually start that process, Lynn? Um, actually, um, Andy? the state will approve changes in speed limits if you can go through the process and show that you have done all of the study that they want because it's really a matter of they're wanting to make sure that uh, municipalities have followed the rules of determining uh, what is the appropriate speed for um, a street and there's a list of factors that um, they have within their guidelines, um, including uh, what people actually as users determine to be the safe speeds of roads, but also what's on the road uh, as far as what kind, uh, kind of, you know, is it residential, is it rural, is there a lot of businesses, how many curb cuts, there, there are a whole series of things and they, and, you know, so what you really have to do is um, have somebody with the expertise to go through that whole set of requirements and um, show that you've done the study using all of the factors that they determine appropriate and then um, propose the speed limit. And they frequently will then approve it if you've gone through the right steps. Um, but it takes uh, time and money to go through that. And that's where, you know, we have to get an order and get, get that done. Yeah. But right. What I hear Jason's question is how do we get 
how do you get your road on the list to be looked at? And yes. And yeah. sorry, Lynn, I just want, I, I'm taking a lot of time. I like, I want to know how to get it started, but then also, I would also like to know what is the metric by which we are assessing the, uh, the success of these traffic calming measures. Mm -hmm. They, we've been told that they're temporary, but I have not heard how are they going to be determined, whether they're going to stay or go and mm -hmm. what, how are they going to be deemed successful? So I, I appreciate it. And, uh, I've asked a lot of questions, so thank you all. Um, Becca, I'll come back to you, but Jeremy Anderson, you're in the audience. Jeremy has been the champion for the uh, speed limit up by the school, so I'm going to ask him to jump in. Jeremy, you need to unmute, and um, I'm going to promote you to panelist. There you go. And now you need to unmute. There you go. Zoom tried to update itself yeah. midway through and it was, it was exciting. Um, but um, so first I just wanted to say Lynn and Andy, I just really appreciate um, all the work you've been doing uh, for the traffic. And 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 as as you both mentioned, it's it has been a very um, I don't know, <laughs> roundabout <Idiot>. route <laughs> to try to get there. Um, but it it's been it's been eye opening and 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 very shocking for me to see you know how how difficult something simple um, should be and, and and yet it becomes such such a you know a process. Um, it's really you know I mean the, the Henry Street um, where you know it's been it's been four years um, and it started because a, a a young child ran out in the road as he was getting uh, picked up by his parents and and that you know it was just eye opening and, and shocking for everyone. Um, and and since then, you know, we've we've gone through you know every hurdle that we can think of, and and really want to thank Joe Comerford uh, and her office for for finding out about the safety zone statute, and and so thinking about uh, Mass General Law uh, Chapter ninety seventeen C, which is the the twenty five mile an hour uh, speed limit, you know, I think this is this is a great step. It shows the community that this is a this is a town council that that cares about safety you know even even if we, you know even if the, it, we know that there's more steps to take these are the type of actions that that show residents that that we're doing something or that you know that, that we care and that we care about children and we care about cyclists and bicyclists and we want a community where people slow down and they walk and they enjoy the forests and they don't want them clear cut you know and that it's just a, a place that for everyone to live um but i i you know i've been Thinking a lot about 17C, especially, and and one thing you know that you know, is critical uh, is that we have posting signs um, and that we we go through the effort to make sure that communities like like Heatherstone um, that are posted at, at higher speed limits that they have a have a process to lower the speed limits and and communities like ours in high point which have no posted signs. You know that that we need signs because if we just put a sign up on Route Nine as people enter town, they're gonna forget about it by the time they get to you know they've they've gone through Flat Hills and they've got here and they're they're cruising again. So we we, we need to make sure those signs are there. Um, and I don't I don't like putting words in people's mouths or speaking for them. Um, but I, I was talking. Uh, I think I think Tracy Zafian, who was here earlier, the chair of the the Transportation Advisory Committee, is a great resource that that should be reached out to. Um, she was. She mentioned to me, and I hope it's okay to mention here that that there are a lot of communities in Massachusetts that have adopted 17C, and a lot of them have been very liberal in their definitions of what a developed or highly developed neighborhood is. So I really appreciate Andy you know, taking the time, finding, you know, making sure we're following the letter of the law. Um, but the experience that I had with Joe Comerford's off and, and her staff is that maybe. Maybe the letter of the law is a little more vague, you know, or that maybe there's a little more flexibility. Um, but so I, I think we there's opportunities to. So I, Jeremy, like... I'm going to suggest that I in my uh, I meet monthly with Joe and Mindy, and I'm going to ask if we can determine if there's a way that we can take a block of roads in Amherst since we're going to be 
looking and hopefully adopting the 25 mile an hour and see if we can take a block that are over 25 mile an hour and figure out a way to shortcut some of this red tape. Yeah, especially, especially Amherst is high density. Most yes. of it is. If, yes. if we can, you know, if the 17C, the, the, the wording of it says, um, in the interest of public safety and without further authority, the town council, um, you know, kind of combining things here, can establish a speed limit of 25 miles per hour on any roadway inside a thickly settled or business district in the city or town that is not a state highway. Okay. I mean, that it, I mean, the, the, the law is very short. The letter is law, but you know, there's lots of subsections and everything. But I, I feel like reaching out to to Senator Comerford, reaching out to Mass DOT, and saying, "Hey, you know," and 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 uh, Chancellor or um, Chair Zafian, and asking, "What are other communities doing? How can we get through uh, some of the red tape on this one?" I I would agree. Uh, Becca, you're back. Yeah, I'm back. I was a follow up question. Um, to what Andy had said about the specifics of the law. And I just wanted to check in, do we not qualify as thickly settled is the only reason we couldn't reduce it because it's already 30. Um, I just don't understand. I haven't, again, like Jeremy said, I haven't read every single section, but from mm. what I understood, we would qualify on a street by street basis if we were considered thickly settled. Um, but are we disqualified from that because we're posted at 30? And then I would also appreciate you, Lynn, um, talking with, uh, sorry, the state representatives. Senator Comerford and Representative Mindy Dom. Yes, I would definitely appreciate you taking that to them and finding out if you could kind of chunk some roads together. Okay, that's all. So after this meeting, I am going to send Lynn, of course, the uh, uh, DOT uh, publication that explains the speed limit rules. And uh, anybody who is interested in it, uh, send me an email to steinberga at amersma.gov, and I will uh, get it. also send it to you because it's just a matter of uh, an email send. But I think it's important to uh, at least have the opportunity, if you're interested, to take a look at it. Um, Renee, we're back to you. Please unmute. Um, I was going to just say something that something totally different. So if I see Becca's hand is up and Michelle's hand, so if they want to stay on this topic, I, I can wait. Michelle, did you want to stay on this topic or move to another one? I just wanted to add one last follow up, and it was just sort of echoing so something somebody said during the TSO meeting, which was, you know, it's not just the mortal danger factor, which is is a thing that we feel viscerally when we're out on the roads and people are swerving behind us, but it's just sort of, to me, a quality of life thing. And when we're talking about making Amherst a nice place to live and attracting families and, you know, increasing like people's um, desire to sort of walk around to stores and just move around people like being on the roads people like walking we've already talked about that in a different context tonight but just sort of the general atmosphere of amr seems to have gone the way of cars and per you know green energy and everybody's health and everything i just think there's a, a lot to be said for calming the streets in a in a real way um to make it you know a pleasant place to live and High Point was uh, narrowed and paved and it really did not work for us. And what it did is just sort of put everybody in the road in the danger of cars. So I know that's used as a traffic calming measure a lot, but from what I've seen, it really has just kind of made it worse. <laughs> and that's all. Thank you for hearing us tonight. Absolutely. Uh, Renee. Uh, yes, um, I just have an announcement to make that the League of Women Voters is gonna be holding a community reception on June 30th from 2.30 to 4.30 to um, help welcome um, Camille Therik. Therik, thank you. Therique, yeah. New press director and um, Gabrielle Ting, our new police chief. So that, and that's gonna be at the Mill River Recreation Area from 2.30 to 4.30 family friendly, free refreshments and everything. So again, um, community, this community reception on June 30th from 2.30 to 4.30.
Thank you. Uh, Jacob, uh, Jason, I'm sorry. I didn't have my glasses on. Jason. No worries. Uh, I would just like to ask how these meetings are disseminated. I had no idea about this had some of our neighbors not mentioned it. Mm -hmm. uh, we joined probably 15, 20 minutes after it started. How, and I, and I went to ma.gov and the calendar didn't have it listed. So it's how under the community side of the, there's two calendars. One is the regular town meetings and the other one is the community town calendar and it's under the community calendar. But the best way for you to find out about these things is to be on my email list and make sure because I, I have a very extensive email list for District 2. It, I don't have everybody. It's just something I've developed over the time I've been in office. Mm -hmm. And I try to send out notices um, and other announcements regularly. Yeah, because I would just, you know, there's, I'm assuming, several thousand people that live in District 2. And there's, what, Quite 25, <laughs> 30 people that were on this meeting for what I believe are probably uh, some very big topics. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, can I get on that list just by sending you an email? Absolutely. Somebody okay. already did earlier today. All right, I appreciate it. G-R-I-E-S-E, -E, M as in Mary, E-R-L, at AmherstMA.gov. All right, thank you. Absolutely. Any other comments, things people want to bring up, questions? In addition to, let me just mention that in addition to the reception that Renee mentioned, we also have Pride Month that we're celebrating this Thursday uh, with both the uh, flag raising, which actually is already up, uh, but then also a panel with the judge who made the decision about same-sex marriage uh, and some of our people in Amherst who were actually the first to be married under the new law back then. And then on uh, Saturday, we Ancestral Bridges is doing their Juneteenth celebration. And then the reception uh, is later in the month. Uh, Jeremy? Yeah, sorry. One, I just also wanted to, I forgot to say thank you to Andy and Lynn for hosting the fifth grade class. Uh, that was a really wonderful event to, to be part of. And it was great seeing all the enthusiasm the kids had for biking. Um, and and if you can, I, I know there's lots of things on the on the agenda, um, but if there's any way to uh, provide resources um, for updating the bicycle and pedestrian plan, um, that that seems to be a major from the conversations I've had a major barrier to the town getting money from the state uh, to make our roads safer for kids, especially and, and for safe routes to school. So okay, uh, again, I'll write that down. It was a great event. So so thank you. Yeah, it was. It's that those are the days that make the job worthwhile is to see so many wonderful young kids and they were just fun. So I I used to be a classroom teacher so years ago in, in the dark ages. Any other comments or questions? I want to thank you all again. Be in touch. Last name, first initial at amherstma.gov. Works for Andy. Steinberg A works for Pam Rooney, Rooney P works for Griesmer, Griesmer L. Okay. Thank you. And please be in touch with other things that you would like me to know about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.